I like to watch. Horror movies have a basic formula. What is it that makes us jump and scream? What do we find scary? Monsters? Serial killers? How about being a teenage girl? A teenage outcast with strange things happening to her body and her mind. In 1974, Massive Horror Stephen King wrote a novel about just that. The story has since been adapted several times, and the story still holds up. In honor of Halloween, I would like to compare the different versions of one of my favorite horror stories. For reasons that should be obvious, I'll be skipping the musical adaptation and the rehash sequel. I want to focus on the novel itself, plus the three film adaptations, including a lesser-known television version. Stephen King's novel introduces us to Carrie White, a teenage girl who has been raised by her single, fundamentalist mother. Her mother's religious fanaticism has grown into full-on abuse. Even the most benign actions are treated as sin in the White household. At school, Carrie is also mistreated, relentlessly bullied for being shy, unattractive, and a product of her upbringing. This is established in the famous opening scene where Carrie gets her first period in the school locker room. Because her mother never explained menstruation to her, she's terrified, thinking she is dying. The girls in the locker room begin mocking her and pelting her with pads and tampons. When Carrie goes home, she is further punished by her mother, who says she is unclean and shoves her into her closet to pray for forgiveness. While all this is happening, Carrie starts to notice the strange things that happen when her emotions run high. Light fixtures shatter, furniture moves, and things generally become unstable. Even as a child, there was a famous incident involving rocks falling from the sky when she was being punished by her mother. Carrie does some research and realizes she has teleconnected powers. Back at school, the girls are punished by their teacher, Miss DeJardin, who feels some pity for Carrie, and some of the popular girls are banned from prom. Only one of those girls, Sue Snell, feels remorse for bullying Carrie and decides to make amends by sending her own boyfriend to prom with Carrie. Her popular main girlfriend, Chris, is still seething from her punishment and uses this as an opportunity to plot revenge on Carrie at prom. Carrie initially rejects the prom invitation, obviously suspecting it as a prank, but Tommy, her prospective date, turns out to be mostly genuine, and Carrie accepts. Her mother goes to great lengths, of course, to stop her, fearing Carrie's sexual awakening, but Carrie goes anyway. She and Tommy are elected prom queen and king, and as they accept their crowns, Chris dumps a bucket of pig's blood on Carrie's head. Carrie is finally pushed to the edge, and her humiliation morphs into sheer rage. Her newly discovered powers manifest, and she not only kills nearly everyone at prom, but sets her entire hometown aflame, leaving many victims in her wake. After killing her own mother, the white home collapses, and Carrie is killed as well. Stephen King wrote Carrie after being accused of never writing about women. He initially meant it to be a short story, and he threw out the first three pages. His wife, Tabitha, retrieved these pages and encouraged him to finish it, so he did, and it became his first published novel. Carrie herself is a composite of two girls with whom King attended school, both of whom eventually committed suicide. Released at the onset of Women's Lib, King himself stated that the novel was partially about how women find their own channels of power, but also what men fear about women's sexuality. At its heart, it's a story of pure horror, released before Columbine, warning readers about the dangers of pushing a delicate psyche too far. One aspect of the book that makes it more fascinating than any of the films is the style in which it is written. King wrote it as an epistolary novel, which is a story told through a series of documents. In between the shifting points of view, one of which is Carrie's herself, we read about the events through newspaper articles, scientific journals, and excerpts from Sue's memoir, among other documents. Because of this, we receive a constantly varied narrative. Brian De Palma's film version of Carrie, released two years after the novel, is perhaps the most well-known. Sissy Spacek plays Carrie, and even though she's a little old for the part, she captures Carrie's vulnerability and scares the hell out of us at the end. Piper Laurie's over-the-top performance as Carrie's fundamentalist mother is one of the things people remember most about this movie. And God made Eve from the rib of Adam, and Eve was weak and loosed the raven on the world. And the raven was called Sin. 
Now, Piper Laurie herself once claimed that she was under the impression she was acting in a comedy, which explains her performance. Because of this, lines like dirty pillows and they're all going to laugh at you have become part of pop culture. Nevertheless, for the most part, the film is a faithful adaptation, much more than a lot of other adaptations of King's novels. Yes, the boys. After the blood come the boys, like snipping dogs. Overall, the film holds up, even though it has some cheesy moments. Sissy Spacek makes us feel sorry for Carrie, but it doesn't make her any less terrifying at the end. Perhaps more than any other visual interpretation of the pig's blood scene, there's just something about this one that makes it so sinister. Oh, sorry, Cassie. Trust me, Carrie. You can trust me. That horrified crimson expression that gives way to the dead eyes. I don't know, man. It still gives me chills. In 2002, much to the chagrin of diehard horror fans, there was a television movie remake of Carrie. Overall, I'm not a fan of this version. It's got that cheaply made TV movie feel of the time, and it focuses way too much on the long arm of the law trying to solve the big mystery of Carrie White. That being said, this version does have a couple of things going for it. First of all, Carrie is played by Angela Bettis, who starred in one of my other favorite horror movies about an outcast girl, May. Of all the film versions, this one comes the closest to getting Carrie's look right. This version also correctly portrays the scene in the book where Carrie is a child and she makes rocks fall from the sky. The scene gives us some early insight as Carrie is being punished for speaking to a neighbor who is sunbathing topless. One huge change is that Sue Snell seems to try to form a friendship with Carrie, which isn't entirely believable. But my biggest complaint about this version? Carrie survives, fakes her own death, and leaves town with the help of Sue. Carrie is a tragic figure in a horror film. That's clearly not how it's supposed to end. Horror movie reboots are pretty much always unnecessary. But the 2013 remake of Carrie gets away with existing for a couple of reasons. You eat shit. The famous locker room scene gains a lot with the addition of a cell phone. The entire humiliating ordeal Carrie faces is captured on video and posted online. One thing that helps this film is the actors are way more age appropriate. They actually look like they're in high school because they're actual teenagers. Carrie's played by Chloe Moretz. And even though she's way too attractive for the role of Carrie, she pulls it off because she's such a damn good actress. In a lot of ways, she almost makes us root for Carrie a little too much. I also really love Julianne Moore's take on Carrie's mom. She's still really creepy, but less over the top than Piper Laurie. I also like that this version gives Margaret some self-harm tendencies, which really kind of explains her character's mental state a little more. In this version, Carrie learns to control her powers, and it looks as though she enjoys having them. That's a big change, and not necessarily one for the better. While Carrie is meant to be a story of empowerment, it's not the type of empowerment that's being portrayed in this film. It's not really female empowerment, although it is a story driven by several strong female characters. Although it's common for members of the audience, self-included, to root for Carrie when she gets back at the bullies, that's not really the point of the story, and it's not the point King was trying to make her look. As I said before, Carrie is a tragic figure, but it doesn't make the deaths of all those people any less tragic. Her rage becomes the tragedy of the entire story, and it becomes the horror of the entire story. One scene from this film I do embrace is the scene where Sue Snell visits Carrie at the house as it's falling apart. She comforts Carrie in her last minutes, and Carrie reveals that she's telepathic as well as telekinetic. It's a girl. What? I don't know. Oh my god. (laughs) 
Carrie has a unique human element that is often missing from horror stories, which is one reason I feel that it stood the test of time. I find it fitting that this is the novel that kicked off Stephen King's illustrious career as a scary story writer. From Two Cent Cinema and all of us here at the Culture Cache, happy Halloween! Hey, Mom, guess what? I got invited to a party tonight, and I'm going to go if that's okay with you. No! It's going to be fun. I'll get to meet new people. They're all going to laugh at you! <laughs>